Grace, mercy, and peace be unto you from God our Heavenly Father and from the Savior who willingly gave up his life for each one of us, Jesus Christ the Lord. Amen. The text from God's Word for this special day comes from the book of James, chapter 1, verse 22, which reads, Do not merely listen to the Word and so deceive yourselves. Do what it says. Thus declares the Word of God. Corey Willis sat in his dad's truck wondering what in the world he had gotten himself into. Mrs. Bartolucci had a mean reputation. She was old and cranky and complained about everything and everyone. Not exactly the kind of person a 16-year-old would want to hang out with. But his pastor's words were still ringing in his ears. It's time to put feet on our faith. It's time to reach out the forgotten, the lonely, the misunderstood. Do you love God enough to love them? See, Mrs. B was on the church's shut-in list. Corey had volunteered to bring her some groceries and to spend a few Saturday afternoons doing chores, running errands, or whatever she wanted him to do. As Corey lugged the box of groceries to the door, he could see an elderly lady staring at him through the kitchen window. Mrs. B, he yelled, I'm from the church. She swung open the door, her face angry, and said, I'm old, not dead. Now don't just stand there like a statue. Bring in my food. Corey set the box down on their kitchen table. Mrs. B looked at it and turned up her nose. This isn't even fit to eat, she said. The room was a little too warm. It smelled of mothballs. Corey watched Mrs. B put on a threadbare sweater. She was a tiny question mark shaped woman. He'd never seen anyone so bent over. Mrs. B handed him a rake, work gloves, and some black plastic bags. Corey followed her into the yard. Stand here, she said. So Corey hesitated and then started raking. I said, stand. You just watch. So she grabbed back her rake. Mrs. B was very particular, first raking the leaves loosely into a pile, scooping up the leaves with an old dustpan, and then pouring them carefully into one of the garbage bags. Finally, she raked all over again in the exact same spot, getting everything. After a while, she showed him how to hold the bag so that she could put the, the leaves in easily. She continued with her raking then, slowly and methodically, and Corey thought to himself, at this rate, we will be raking this yard until Christmas. Mrs. B, why, why don't you go lie down, he said. I'll finish, okay, trying to speed up the process. She narrowed her eyes at him and said, lie down indeed. I'm old, not dead. Well, at least not yet. But a short time later, she said, well, my back does hurt. We'll just put these things up and you can come back tomorrow. But, 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 tomorrow. It was the start of a bad pattern. She couldn't do more than a small section of her lawn at a time, but she just wouldn't let him help except to hold the bag. And she was so bossy, so, so picky. He didn't feel free to say no to her the next day, or the next, or the next. One day, though, as Mrs. B was bending over to scoop up some leaves, Corey noticed that she was in a lot of pain. It was amazing to think that she did this alone every year. Mrs. B, he said, I, I need to learn how to do this stuff. Why don't we take turns scooping up the leaves? You can tell me if I'm doing something wrong. She gave him a kind of a suspicious look. You bet I will, she growled. So they took turns. And she criticized. At first, he felt a little irritated about it, but then he made a game out of it. He tried to do it exactly the way she wanted him to, 
And she never dished out compliments, so he would take silence to be doing it right. And he started a game where he kept track by points. One point if she didn't say anything, uh, one point against if she growled or looked cross-eyed at him. Um, by the way, he was always in the hole some. And then Mrs. B stumbled once, and she was crankier than ever. Corey soon realized that Mrs. B was a very proud woman, and being slowed and bent over was very hard on her. Corey liked it best when she would hold the bag and he would scoop the leaves into it, especially if people were coming by. He actually liked the way people looked at him when he was helping Mrs. B. One day, Corey brought his own rake, and, and they took turns at that too, uh, with that too. My dad doesn't even rake this good, Mrs. B, he commented, dragging another full bag of leaves to the side of the road. Well, you have to keep up things, she said, or someone will get the idea that you belong in a nursing home. Corey thought about that comment a lot. And he began to understand the fear that she lived with. One Saturday, she was pale when he came and knocked on her door. She pushed her uncombed hair out of her eyes. You have to go. I, I don't feel up to, to working today. Part of Corey leaped at the thought of having a Saturday off. But he said, that's okay, Mrs. B. We'll just take turns like always. I'll do mine today, and you can take your turn tomorrow. Corey expected her to reject his idea, but she wavered. Okay, I guess. Encouraged, Corey said, you just go rest and are you patronizing me? Mrs. B immediately snapped. I don't even know what that means, Corey said. It means don't talk down to me as if I were a child. I'm old, not stupid. And with that, she slammed the door. On Monday, though, no one answered the door. When Corey came, he peeked through the window and was surprised to see that Mrs. B's dishes weren't done. He banged on the door and just waited for her to say, I'm old, not deaf. But Mrs. B didn't come to the door. That evening, the phone rang, and his mom glanced at him as she was talking to someone. What, Corey said, am I in trouble or something? Honey, Pastor Wheeler thought you would want to know that Mrs. B is in the hospital. He said you were the only kid she's ever let help her. You know, maybe she'd be better off in a nursing home. And Corey snapped this time. Don't even think about that, Mom. Then he asked his dad if he could borrow the truck. He told him he had something important he had to do. Corey felt nervous when he walked down the bright hall of the hospital. At the nurse's station, he asked for Mrs. Bartolucci's room. The nurse stared at him and said, Sorry, young man, it's way past visiting hours. He felt his chest tighten. Could, could I write her a note? He said, hopefully. Mrs. B is a friend of mine. The nurse did not answer, but handed him a small square of note paper. Corey printed out a simple message. Mrs. B, front yard is a mess. Come home soon. We've got work to do. Corey. He watched the nurse take the note in to Mrs. B's room. His elderly friend read the note and then raised her head weakly and looked at him. He gave her a little wave. When she nodded at him, she had a slight grin on her face. It was the first time Corey had ever seen her smile. Corey smiled back. Then his pastor's words flooded through his thoughts again. The forgotten, the lonely, the misunderstood. Corey felt as if he was finally beginning to understand Mrs. B. And he began to understand what it means to put feet on one's faith. And by the way, that's my prayer for all of you this day. And not just the seven of you, 
certainly is my prayer for the seven of you, but for all of you. I hope you will learn, if you haven't already, what it means to put feet on your faith. You see, so often our faith is just a matter of head knowledge. Things we memorized of doctrine, of learning. And, and for many of us, that's all it remains. We never do put feet on our faith. We never do really strive to live out God, what we learn from God's word. We never really are that concerned about living out God's will for our lives. Now, for the seven confirmands of this year, for three years... You've met with Matt or Pastor Laguton or me on Wednesday evenings. You've read through much of the Bible and the small catechism. You've written countless sermon summaries, did all kinds of memory work, wrote down answers to theological questions each week. You've done all these things. But now it's time to put feet on your faith. Now's the time for you to truly live out the faith. Now's the time for you to take in everything you've learned over the last three years and let it be seen in your lives. And of course, that's the point that uh, James is saying to all of us in our text. Don't just listen to the word. Do what it says. James tells us to put feet on our faith. Show your love for Christ by the way you live your life. Don't just learn the word of God. Live the word of God. But what exactly does that mean to put feet on our faith? Well, first of all, it most certainly does mean reaching out to the hurting, lonely people around us. The people like Mrs. B in the story. It means letting your faith lead you to visit shut-ins and people in hospitals or nursing homes. It means letting your faith lead you to reach out in friendship to the new kid in school or in friendship to the new family at church. It means letting your faith lead you to reach out in friendship and love to those who seem to be picked on by everyone else or ignored by everyone else. It means letting your faith lead you to volunteer to rake leaves or help at a soup kitchen or go on a mission trip or help at a sharing center or volunteer at a homeless shelter. It means reaching out with love to as many people as you possibly can. But putting feet on your faith also means using your feet to walk or better yet, even run away from all forms of sin or immorality. Putting feet on your faith means walking away from drugs or alcohol. It means running away from sexual immorality. It means not even allowing yourself to be alone with a person of the opposite sex so that you cannot be tempted. Putting feet on your faith means walking away from a fight. It means walking away from gossip and dirty jokes and vulgar language. Putting feet on your faith means saying no to anything that might damage your faith or ruin your credibility as a child of God. And third, putting feet on your faith means using your feet to remain active in worship, in Bible study, in Holy Communion. You know, for years now, probably, your parents have kind of made you come to church and Sunday school and confirmation class and youth groups. Well, quite honestly, putting feet on your faith means now that you will choose to do those things. You will choose to come to church on Sunday. You'll choose to be involved in worship and Bible study. You'll choose to be involved in youth group. You will choose to have ongoing, regular contact with Jesus Christ through the means of grace. Putting feet on your faith means you make sure that you stay active in word and sacrament even if your parents aren't pushing you as hard as they used to. Putting feet on your faith means doing all these things and a whole lot more. And quite honestly, that's a major part of what you'll be promising today. So here's the big question. Why in the world would you choose to do these things? I mean, why would you choose to use your life for God instead of just for yourself? Why would you strive to live out his commandments? Of course, the answer to that question is found in the words of Jesus, also in the Gospel of John. 
Jesus said there, if anyone loves me, he'll obey my teaching. Yeah, love for Jesus. That's why we want to put feet on our faith and do all these things we've been talking about and more. Why would we love Jesus enough to do all that? Well, certainly you confirmands understand the answer to this question. For you know what Jesus did for you. I'm going to quote from some of your essays that you wrote for your public exam. So these, if you got the booklet, these are just little brief excerpts from each one of theirs. Jesus loves us so much that he took a brutal and humiliating death just so that we could have eternal life with heaven in him. What Jesus did for me is he gave up his life for all my sins. What Jesus has done for me is that he died on the cross and redeemed me from all my sins. He saved me from eternal death. Jesus cares so much about me that he died for me and saved me from certain and everlasting death and pain in hell. He willingly suffered the weight of the sin of all people so that all of us could spend eternity with him. Christ did all this for me. He suffered torture and humiliation for me. He bore my sins for me so that I could be free of them. He died a most painful death while nailed to a cross for me. What did Jesus do for me? The simple answer would be that he suffered and died on the cross to save us from our sins. Jesus suffered so that we might be saved and have eternal life with him. That's what you guys wrote. Those are your words about Jesus. And they tell us why now we're willing to put feet on our faith and use every moment of our life for him. We've experienced Jesus' love. We know how much he loved us. We know what he didn't went through for us. And the fact that he was even willing to suffer and die on the cross so that we could be forgiven and have eternal life with him and the glory of heaven... That's why we put feet on our faith. I mean, Jesus put feet on his love for us. He took on human feet and a human body. And then with those feet, walked up that dusty road to Calvary. Where those feet were pierced by a nail. And that body put to death on a cross in our place. I mean, that's some kind of love that Jesus has for us. And that's the love that inspires us to love him back and to show that love for him by the way we live our lives. That love of Christ leads us not just to listen to his words, but to truly strive to do what he says. That kind of love leads us into obedience. Three pastors were once talking about the problem of bats in their church buildings. Uh, by the way, my home church had bat problems for years. I once killed one of them in there, yay me. The first time Denise visited my home congregation, a uh, bat swooped out right in the middle of church, kind of distracted from the sermon for a little bit there. But they were talking about bats in their church buildings. One pastor explained that they had hired an exterminator, but that within a few weeks, the bats had returned. A second pastor told how the members of their church had tried to seal up every tiny opening through which the bats could be entering into their building. But they still continued to come. The per third pastor, though, said this. We know how to take care of the problem of bats in our church. We confirm them. And once we do, we'll never see them again. <laughs> now, unfortunately, there's a little bit of reality in that. Because sometimes people are going to confirmation classes because their parents are making them. I want you to put feet on your faith because that's what you want to do for Jesus. I want you to not just have learned the word of God, but to live the word of God. So that's my prayer for our seven confirmands of this year. But it's also my prayer for all of you. May the cross of Jesus Christ so overwhelm us all that we can't help but use our lives for him. May his life and death for us lead us to use our lives for him. May the fact that his feet were nailed to a cross for us cause us to put feet on our faith and live for him.
As the pastor said in the story of Corey and Mrs. B, it's time to put feet on your faith. Well, indeed it is, my friends. It's time. It's really time. In Jesus' name, amen.